Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today, and unfortunately, our sister Ashley wasn't able to join us today, but Tasha is here with me. Say hello. hi. Wow, she read my mind, she already was saying <laughs> hello. <laughs> and we are very thankful to have a very special guest with us today. We've never interviewed a music composer before, and today we have one of the best with us, in my opinion, and that is Jared DePasquale. Thank you for joining us, Jared. Aw, uh, thanks Austin, that's very kind of you to say. Well... You do a lot of different different music, and a lot of people will remember you from uh, folks on the radio theater dramas like The Secret Garden, The Hiding Place, and also um, some Interest in Odyssey episodes, and more recently for um, Colonial Radio Theater and also Augustine Institute Radio Theater. So, let's start at the very beginning. When did you first know that you wanted to make music? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I began to play the electric guitar at the age of 14. And it was really at that point I knew I wanted to write music. You know, I kind of looked at the guitar as an outlet to write rather than just an instrument to play everybody else's classic rock riffs. And so even though I learned everybody's classic rock riffs, I always spent most of my time trying to write music. And this was in the, the mid to late 80s and technology. It wasn't as sophisticated as it, as it is today for young people. So at the time, my brother and I, we purchased this four-track recorder. And this is an actual cassette recorder that splits the tape into four tracks. I mean, it's kind of unthinkable now with the way technology is. But we spent all our time writing and recording music. You know, We bought an early sequencer, and we programmed drum parts, and I overdubbed guitar and vocal parts. And you know, we were so young and the music was so bad, but yet we were really learning an important thing in our high school years, which was how to write and record and arrange music. Who would you say are the biggest influences on your music? Ah, uh, influences. I have a lot of influences and I love talking about influences because they're people who have inspired me so much. You know, I would say my first influence is always that I saw Star Wars at the age of seven and that was really the game changer for me. And even though I hadn't picked up an instrument, I was just in love with that sound, you know, the music of John Williams. And I really still am. You know, those John Williams scores to Star Wars and Indiana Jones, they're just absolutely carved into my mind as my earliest musical influences. And I think in some way I'm always referencing those scores. But, you know, once I, um, once I started to play music in high school as a guitar player, I listened to a lot of progressive rock. And, and most people probably now wouldn't know what progressive rock is, but they were bands like rush and genesis and yes and these were bands that were writing really lengthy and complex arrangements and they always had some sort of story to their music and i think that's what i've always been drawn to was that i was always drawn to these epic and highly arranged bands and telling you know being a part of the storytelling process um i'd say as far as like other film composers go for influences i've always been a huge fan of howard shore and I, I loved his scores right away when he was doing all of these suspense thrillers. But it was really his music to Lord of the Rings that uh, I just think it's some of the most beautiful music I've ever heard, period. And, I mean, if there's one guy I could study with, that would be him without without a doubt. And as far as, like, another influence, you know, I went through a phase where I stopped listening to uh, film composers and started to just listen primarily to classical composers. So I would say that, Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring has probably been one of the most influential pieces of music for me. I spent months and months just looking at that score and transcribing it into piano reductions and really began to understand his view of music and then kind of adapt that into my view. So, um, you know, he was also a really successful ballet composer. And so there you go. He's like another storyteller. He's not a guy just writing music. He's writing music for a story. So I think that's another reason why uh, he's so influential for me. A lot of influences, I know. I could talk about influences all day, I, you know. Yeah. I have to say, though, um, I kind of grew up playing in an orchestra, and that the Star Wars music is pretty awesome, just the way it's all written. It is, you know. And I think that, I think that finally orchestras in the classical medium are really – really just embracing John Williams as really one of the greatest American composers we have. And so you're seeing Star Wars actually becoming like legit concert music now. So that makes me happy. I'm glad you like playing it. And speaking of instruments, um, I know some of the music that you do you synthesize, but there's a lot of music that you actually play the actual instruments in the score. So what is your favorite instrument to play? Ah, yeah. You know, and that's, I think that's... um. Probably an advantage I have as a guitar player 
is that I'm I can pick up a lot of different stringed instruments and and make some noise on it that can sound okay. I would say my favorite instrument to play right now is my oud, and that is a uh, that's a Middle Eastern stringed instrument, kind of similar to a guitar. It's probably one of the earliest guitars. I mean, it's not a guitar, but in that family that we have. And, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely horrible at the oud, particularly just because it's so hard. And, and what makes it hard is that it doesn't have any frets. So that means if you're just a little off in your left hand, the pitch is going to be sharp or flat, kind of like a violin in that way. But um, you need a really good ear to play it. And like I said, I, I love playing it. Particularly, I just love Middle Eastern music. And, and so I find a lot of comfort in playing my oud. Yeah, well, I know... Um... Tasha is um, the better musician of the bo- both of us. I, I uh, learned how to play the piano fairly young and took lessons um, through high school, and I've kind of stopped since then. But Tasha, she's uh, she's played the violin for several years, and um, she played a lot of music by ear on the piano too. So cool, go Tasha! Yeah, she she is she is pretty amazing. Like I I know like I I practice and try hard with it, and then I like a piece of music like for a recital or, recital or something like that and trying to play that and then I'd come walk away from it and then Tasha would sit down play with the keys a little bit and then play the whole thing I tried tried for a long time to get with just like in a few minutes so I'm kind of jealous of that but yeah she is pretty talented yeah well you know I can always tell though Austin that you have a great ear for music and because your your reviews of of anything you're doing it's always very astute I think you pick out a lot in people's scores that that gets missed by your average uh reviewer so i think you've got a really good ear going well i i am interested in sound a lot of that kind of sound work not necessarily music um just basically like voices or um sounds and of course music too but for me for a long time um i for any kind of music i wasn't real interested listening to it because i grew up listening to radio dramas and um, mostly adventures in odyssey and for a long time, I just listened to that, like when I had a spare time. But then I started listening to more regular songs, um, a lot of Southern gospel, and I listened to that a lot. And it hasn't been real long ago that I started listening to more just instrumental music, like a lot of soundtracks, and just kind of fell in, fell in love with that kind of stuff. Not not everything I enjoy listening to, but uh, hearing a lot of uh, scores for um, plays or um, radio, um, I've been really it's it's really got me a lot more interested in it. even though i'm not able to uh play like i used to in, anymore which i don't think was ever very good to begin with but i i kind of enjoyed it for a while there but just hearing really great music and really thought out music that's not just you know there's a lot of music today that's just you know pretty much by the books it's somebody that brings it brings a different level to it that you can tell it's very emotional and you have um a real I don't know, it's really a full a full sound, even though it may not be a lot of instruments. It's there's a lot of uh, that goes into it, and you're able to pick that out and um, and just kind of probably jumping ahead a little bit. But your um, the soundtrack for uh, Little Women that you did that was released, I think, last year. I've been listening to it quite a bit le- recently, um, like my breaks or um, if I'm working on homework or something like that. And it has been probably my favorite. My it's probably my favorite soundtrack ever to listen to oh man thanks and it's it's has so many wide range of emotions in the theme for little women like the da 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 yeah yeah i love picking that out through the whole thing i've heard the story a couple times before but hearing the music it it stands so well on its own that it's it can be enjoyed so well like that yeah that i have great memories of that score that was such a i love the book and i love that drama and um yeah, that theme, that's a good that was a good theme. I and and I knew that it would serve that story really well and I knew that it was very adaptable to various situations in the in the show. I mean, it's almost like you can listen to that score down and you can kind of track the story without the words, you know. How did you come to start composing for Focus on the Family Radio Theater? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. I was it was a long time ago. I was living in Nashville in, in around I think it was like 1999. And I was working as a composer and a session musician, and my agent at the time told me about Focus on the Family's radio theater products, and they were relatively new, and they had just maybe launched the Narnia series. And my agent was trying to get me that work, but um, Focus had said that that project, the Narnia stuff, was already assigned to a composer. But my agent spoke to Dave Arnold for quite a bit, 
and it didn't really lead anywhere. And, you know, I'm sure at the time Focus was getting a lot of inquiries from people calling themselves composers. And to be fair, it's hard to recognize who can who can just write, you know, a pretty little piece of music or who can actually understand what it means to deliver a 90 minute score on a tight deadline. So, you know, after that initial conversation with Dave Arnold, I went on to score a bunch of films just right in a row. And I sent a promo CD to Dave Arnold of one of those scores. And I think it's always been my guess that that score impressed them enough to know that I had what it takes to um, to handle a score and to deliver on time and all of that stuff. And within a few weeks of Dave receiving that promo CD, they called me for uh, The Secret Garden. Um, how did you go about um, working on The Secret, Gar- um, Secret Garden? How, is that, how did that differ from the future projects that you did for them? Well, you know, I mean, with regards to The Secret Garden, that was, that was my first audio drama I'd, I had ever done. And I really, man, that was a hard project simply because I just wasn't getting the medium very well. And I had, I had grown up in the film medium. I mean, I had scored a lot of visual stuff. And I was writing like a film composer, not like a radio composer. I, I wasn't hitting the turns right. I wasn't, I wasn't really reading the script in details, realizing what I needed to hit. And um, man, I think like the first 25 cues I wrote on The Secret Garden all came back with revisions and... I was so distraught. I was I, at one point. I really just thought of quitting. I just thought, man, you got to get somebody else who knows how to do this. But I think Dave Dave talked me down from the ledge, and I just gutted through it. And slowly, I began to figure it out. And you know, over time, I've really come to love the uh, audio theater format and really em- embrace the challenge of what it is. So, yeah, the Secret Garden is a special score for me, just because it was it was such a learning experience. You know. So was the score for the Secret Garden was that all synthesized or was that an orchestra? That was a small orchestra with my synthesizers. I um, let's see, that was my that was my first score I did for them, and so their budget for me was smaller than it would get. They, the budgets got larger as they probably got more confidence in me. But I used a small string section and a small woodwind section, and um, a couple French horns. And then my brother and I played a load of instruments just because the Secret Garden, you know, there's India thing. So I played some tabla and I played sitar and bazooki and my brother played some Irish flutes on it. So there's a ton of live instruments uh, in that. But we just we we kind of played them one at a time rather than what I would go to do later, which is the big orchestra where everybody's on the stage together. Okay. Uh, I I kind of wondered about that because I know it didn't have as, quite as fuller sounds as like uh, Hiding Place or Little Women had later. So I was wondering, and it's also mi- it's also mixed differently too. I mean, we it the whole thing was a learning curve, you know, as far as like, because even in the audio world, there's different ways to mix music, which makes it sound back or forward or present, and how to kind of not conflict with the actors and all these things I would learn over time and. And, you know, get better as I went along. So um, moving on to um, another show that you did for Focus on Family. Um, it's a little bit of a different format than radio theater. How did you come to work on Adventures in Odyssey? Ah, Odyssey. Yeah, you know, I um, I was called by Dave Arnold in late 2003 to score Little Women. And it got delayed. And it got delayed by like three or four months. And so I had, I had kind of you know, carved out that time and I was kind of just not working. And I think that Dave he probably felt bad for me. And he gave me these two episodes of Odyssey. He gave me the American Revelation part one and two. And so this was done during my waiting for Little Women. And it was a great experience. You know, I, I think that they maybe liked my take on it just because they knew I could handle kind of like war stuff, like with Les Mis, kind of the battles and all of that. And so I was a good fit for that particular score. It's hard to jump into Odyssey just simply because I don't have a pulse for it the way John Campbell does. I mean, he invented the music for that stuff. So um, I always enjoy jumping in, but it is a challenge just because I don't track the story um, the way the listeners are so uh, into it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what about the... um... I know you worked on a few more episodes, um, like uh, The Last I Do and also Prisoners of Fear and also most recently um, uh, When One Door Closes, which I was real, I was really excited when I heard that you were doing the music for that. Oh, cool. Did you did you like that one? Yes. I mean, not just the music itself. I mean, the whole story was just really amazing. One of the, I think one of the best episodes Odyssey has ever made. And I know that episode 
was uh, very different than the other Odyssey episodes you've done because it's in a more of a um, Middle Eastern country. So was it more challenging doing that one than the other Odyssey episodes that you had done? No, you know, it was actually probably easier because I, um, I really, like I said, I love Middle Eastern music. And, and over pretty much the last five years, well, that's not true. I think actually my whole career I've always been into it. I've always I've just had the opportunity to work with a lot of really good uh, Middle Eastern players. You know, when I was young, I was an apprentice for uh, Joseph Laduca, where so I got to work on Xena, the Warrior Princess, and Hercules, and and those scores had amazing musicians on it, Arabic musicians, and then some of my own stuff. Recently, I had done a lot of Arabic music, so Dave and Dave knew that, and he had heard some of my recent work where I was using all of these uh, Arabic musicians, and so I think that he 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 knew he wanted me right away. And so actually it wasn't all that hard. It was actually just really fun, you know, to do that one. And yeah, you know, I think they just reach out to me from time to time when they feel like the score has to feel more like a film score, like some adventure film score than it does the traditional Odyssey palette. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can see that. Um, they did, they did some episodes recently, um, called one more name. I'm not sure if you heard them yet, but, um, well, the story about Irina Sendler, um, a Polish woman that saved several, about 2,500 Jewish children during World War II. And I kind of want, I hadn't heard anything about it. I kind of wondered if you had done the film, uh, if you had done the score for that, because it seemed like the kind of episode that you'd write for. John, I know John, Camp, John Campbell did it, but it seemed like the kind of an episode that would be similar to like what you did with The Hiding Place. Is it a recent Odyssey episode, like somewhat recent? Yeah, it's on the Odyssey, or actually the Adventures in Odyssey Club now. It's the three brand new episodes. Oh, cool. Yeah, you know, those they had reached out to me when I was scoring uh, The Trials of St. Patrick, and they had asked, because everybody kind of knows, like, because Dave Arnold is involved with uh, the Paul McCusker Augustine stuff, so they knew I was working on Patrick because Dave is their boss, and Dave's working on it, and they kind of said, hey, so can you... Can you do two things at the same time? Can you score Odyssey and Patrick at the same time? And I was like, man, I just can't, you know, not with the enormity of Patrick. So I did turn down an Odyssey score that I wasn't, I don't know which one it was, but maybe it was that one, you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, it was still great. I mean, I, I love John Campbell's work, but when I heard the kind of story and, and the kind of, it was, it was another, some other great Odyssey episodes too, I like, I mean, this would this this would really fit into uh, Jared's uh, music musical uh, area. Yeah, you know, ever since I've done the Hiding Place, I get a lot of people lean on me for like those type of stories. I've done other people have reached out to me too for the very same reason of they heard the Hiding Place, and so they they feel like I have um, the ability to kind of enter into that really dark world of of that time period. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I when I was reviewing those episodes, um, I mentioned that World War II is like my favorite period of history to study because there's so much, there's so many great stories of people, heroic people that um, help um, defend the Jews and other people and help fight back against the darkness and and music like um, like for the Hiding Place and like what John, John and what John Campbell did for One More Name, it adds it adds so much to that. It really puts it breathes life life into these stories. Yeah. And any any period of history, um, um, music could help uh, portray the stories, but especially for that time period, because I'm a lot more interested in that. It's very, it it really does add to it, and you get the feeling of that of the the emotions that a lot of people had then. Absolutely, it's very hard music, you know, to write music of that time period. Very hard. Hiding Place is incredibly hard. Anytime I have to dive into the 1940s of music, it's it's really stressful. What kind of medium do you like to score music for the most? Audio or video? Ah, uh, you know, that that's really a question I simply can't answer because they're so different. And they're they're both so special, but they're both so different. You know, and, and like we talked about, I spent my early radio theater days trying to be a film composer and, and just failing very horribly at it. But I think what I love about the audio drama format is just that the music the role of music becomes just a few notches more important, you know, as you have to communicate things that are unseen. You have to communicate actors' emotions when you can't see their faces, and you have to communicate action that's going on, locations, and, and that's really challenging stuff. I mean, and, you know, not everybody is cut out to do radio theater scores, and 
Um, you have to dig really deep to find the right orchestrations and melodies and tempo, and it's it's a lot of fun. And then on top of that, the scenes can have so many turns. I mean, you could have a two-minute scene with, man, like 40 turns. It's incredible. It takes forever to write these cues now, you know? I think, I think the more I see as I get older, the longer the cues take. But that's kind of part of the fun. But, you know, and I think what makes film so fun is just that you have the opportunity to stretch out your music in a way that the audio theater doesn't allow you to. You know, with audio theater, you might have a five second window between scenes where your music can kind of rise up and become the lead character, but you're going to settle back down to get to get under those actors. And, you know, with film, you might have a two minute sequence where there's really no dialogue and the visual is telling the story. And it's in these moments that you get to really expand your themes and develop them in ways that you never could with audio theater. I mean, even like how long a theme is in audio theater, like you'll never write a 16 bar melody for audio theater because it's never going to get played in its entirety. Um, Where in film, it'll get played all the time. You know, like audio theater is all about like small sound bites and just kind of moving very fast. So I know I didn't answer your question, but I kind of just talk about that's kind of like it's why I love both those mediums. All right, that's fine, because we got another tough question for you. What's your favorite score that you've done? Ah, you know, it's actually not that tough. My favorite score I've written is the one I finished this past December for call for uh, Paul McCusker and the Augustine Institute, and it's The Trials of St. Patrick. And I feel like that represents the best of my strengths when it comes to writing music. It's this hybrid score that kind of incorporates traditional or more like ancient Irish music with a massive orchestra, massive choir, along with soloists, and then there's like a barbaric angle for the druids and that score, it allowed me to work with two really amazing soloists. I got to work with um, a soprano out of Chicago named Sarah Vanderplug, who, um, I mean, she might have one of the most beautiful voices on the planet. And I took a verse out of the Bible. I took a Joshua 1.9 and had it translated into Gaelic. And Sarah sang Patrick's theme in Gaelic. Um, it's just bone chilling. And then I got to work with a... Um, a girl out of Hamburg, Germany, who specializes in ancient medieval Celtic woodwinds, and her name is uh, Jessica Baran Sorel, and her playing on the score is amazing. I mean, she she's playing these instruments that were used like a thousand years ago, and so the score just has such a unique sound to it. And um, yeah, so anyway, that's I love that score. I'm so proud of that score. Yeah, we we've yet to hear. Um that one yet but i'm i'm really looking forward to hearing it it's an it's insane i I, i've told everybody it has to be heard to be believed it is it is epic the episodes five six and seven are are some of the the biggest productions i've ever heard out of an audio theater project wow yeah i'm definitely gonna have to hear that soon which score was the hardest one to make Ah, and that would be the same answer. So the hardest score would also be The Trials of St. Patrick. And the greatest challenge for me in general, and for for this particular score too, it's to find the right balance of like musical integrity to the story and time period, but then kind of balancing the entertainment value that you need to have to keep a story moving and to keep people entertained, you know? And so I always try to bring this musical integrity to whatever it is I do, whether it was Francis and and really uh, researching medieval music. But with the Trials of St. Patrick, you know, I um, kind of, you know, I've I've done Celtic music a lot. So it's kind of like the challenge of of fusing Celtic music into the orchestra. But it can't just be happy Celtic music because the St. Patrick story is, is just so epic. But, you know, I think I think what made this score so hard was this one particular scene that I knew this was the reason they hired me. Like this was the money scene. This was, this was essentially where I was earning my paycheck for that, this one scene. And the, the whole story kind of crescendos to Patrick eradicating the Druids, uh, their power out of Ireland, kind of the stronghold that the Druids had over the people. And so episodes five and six, Patrick is defeating the Druid priests through all of these kind of like show of power in the same way like Elijah was with the prophets of Baal. 
But in episode seven, Patrick journeys across these desolate plains to meet this demon that everyone worships and considers the main god of Ireland. And it's this is real deal historic stuff. And, you know, and according to Patrick's letters, the the demon is is actually like manifested. And so I had to score this scene and it's an it's an eight minute music cue. And I had never written an eight minute music cue. And it was so hard. It was the most difficult piece of music I've ever written. And um, it's this kind of exorcism scene. And Paul McCusker just wrote just an amazing script right there. So anyway, the, the cue took over a week to write. I mean, I, I spent so much time on my knees in prayer just asking God to kind of show me, show me the music, help me find it, help me to find everything, the, the tempo, the pacing, the harmony, and everything. It just felt so overwhelming. And man, when I finished that scene, I I was exhausted. And uh, I think I took like three days off just to recover from that scene alone. Wow. You're going to love it. I'm telling you, it's, it's, I, I think that scene alone might be one of the best audio theater moments I've ever heard. If I wasn't excited before, I think I'd be excited now. And we got a couple more, que- couple more questions for you. Um, if you could compose music for a specific story for any medium, what would it be? That's a good question. You know, I am, I'm a huge lover of C.S. Lewis. I always have been ever since I was a kid. If there's one thing I wished I could have scored, it would have been the Chronicles of Narnia. And and that's not to say I think what John Campbell did is amazing. And I think their production is amazing. I mean, I, I still listen to those audio dramas for entertainment and for encouragement. I just, I, they're so good. But I'm a huge lover of that world. Um, I know those characters so well. And I so I would have loved a shot at um, at that. But... Alas, you know, um, you know, I was thinking about it, like, just kind of like, what would it be if I could tell a, you know, if I could get involved in a project, I'd say I, I, I've always been drawn to the world of fantasy. And I think that's why the trials of St. Patrick was such a good story for me, even though it's not fantasy, it feels fantastical, like, because it takes place in like 400 AD, where the world is very barbaric. And, um, and so I just love that, you know, like what Lord of the Rings is, that is, that's a wheelhouse I'd love to live in. And so I think that's why I did so well at Patrick. Um, so that's kind of the best I can answer is just the, the world of fantasy stuff. I is just stuff I love to get involved in. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree. The, the Narnia dramas, they're, they're really amazing. They're probably some of my favorite radio dramas ever. And actually that's, I was, I never read the books when I was um, growing up. I, I'd, I'd never really heard of Narnia until I heard the, the line the witch in the wardrobe the first drama there and i i loved it and i heard the ones that came out after that and then it was until a while later to have read all the books by themselves but and all the adaptate and some of the adaptations have come out since then but really those they are so amazing even though they've been they're over like probably close to like over 10 years old now i think but they're really amazing absolutely i actually think they're better than the films i think they just they they nailed the spirit of Narnia, particularly Aslan, uh, better than the films did. I know you said you're a fan of C.S. Lewis, so maybe if Radio Theater or somebody else does a dramatization of C.S. Lewis's uh, science fiction um, stories, maybe you could do that. I know, and Out of the Silent Planet. Yeah, if anybody's doing Out of the Silent Planet, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I think Paul McCusker talked about it. I don't know if it was when I was interviewing him or someone else was, but I think he mentioned about that he would love to do that, but it's a really be a really hard book to adapt for for radio because it's very it's very very visual no doubt no doubt you know it's hard to know if those books were meant to be adapted or not or whether they're just best left alone and tasha you get the honors of asking the last question all right what other projects are you currently working on i uh i just finished up a score to colonial radio theater's adaptation of a book called andy smithson blast of the dragon's fury and that was a blast that was it's um the score is very much a john williams fantasy score for young people and and so that just finished up and that was a blast that probably is going to be released probably in a couple weeks and uh i'm just starting to work on the uh, jonathan park reboot and so i finished the main title last week and i'm currently just starting their first episode and um I know that the Brinkman Adventures will come in probably in the summer. 
uh, their sixth season, I believe. And then uh, Paul, I know Paul McCusker is trying to get another saint approved by the powers that be. And so I'm really hoping that my 2017 ends with, uh, with a saint. So I'm, I've been very busy. I feel incredibly blessed. You know, I, I always say not a day goes by where I don't understand how fortunate I am to be writing music every day. I'm very fortunate. Yeah, and we're we're very fortunate to have you with us today to talk about all this. Um, I've been a, a big fan of your work for a long time, and a lot of a lot of the times people they hear just a name in the credits, and that's about all they hear. But um, get you know the people that makes all parts of an audio drama the writing the acting the music the sound design um getting to know everything that goes into um um, making making that just gives you a better appreciation for the stuff that you're listening to so thank you very much absolutely awesome my pleasure to talk to you